In this week's update, the dilemmas investors face. Having your cake and eating it too. Correction in precious metals. And the US market rally looks sustainable. My name's Gary Davis, and as always, this is general advice only. And remember to subscribe and like the video. I just want to start with an issue that uh, I've had quite a lot of questions on of late because I've been making the case for growth stocks versus the old uh, old economy, old world kind of approach to investing. And I'm, I certainly get challenged by investors that uh, still seem to be stuck in the old ways of doing things. So I want to provide a, uh, another example today, a more specific uh, example to really illustrate what I mean. So there is a dilemma out there for investors, and I understand that dilemma because when we've been doing something a certain way for a long period of time, it's, um, it's sometimes hard to change. But the dilemma that many investors face is either staying with the traditional approach, let's call it that, uh, of focusing on dividends and defensive type assets that are going to be good over the long term. And there is still the vast majority of commentators and brokers out there that will tell you that this is the way that you should go and that this, um, this new growth economy that we're in is some sort of aberration and it's too risky. Well, the other alternative is to adopt a different approach and go into stocks which often appear expensive and therefore seemingly risky. They don't pay much, if any, dividend, but they do have uh, strong tailwinds and strong growth ahead. Um, so that really is the, um, is the equation for a, a lot of people. So let me give you an example of um, two different types of companies, one in each of those uh, particular groups. And I've, I, I could have chosen any one of uh, dozens and dozens of companies to make this comparison. But I'm going to use Telstra and compare it with CSL. CSL is now the biggest company in the Australian market. So if we look at Telstra, and I've gone back five years, that was really just an arbitrary decision. I didn't choose that time period because it um, made my uh, argument look better. I just decided to choose five years as a reasonable period to look over. So if we had bought Telstra, which is obviously one of the, the uh, most traditional kind of investments for dividend investors, so if we bought into Telstra and we bought a thousand shares in July of 2015, then we would have paid $6.15, and it's marked here on the chart. And at the time, Telstra was yielding uh, about just a, a fraction over 5% yield. Now, the dividends since then that have been received totaled uh, $1,005 in total. But along the way, the dividend has been reduced from, it was 31 cents, uh, a share per annum and it's now down to 13 cents a share per annum. So there's been a very significant cut in the dividend. Now the, the current yield if you are buying Telstra today is still around about 5% so the yield hasn't really changed. But the yield if you would bought it in 2015 the yield that you're getting now is only 2.1% so your yield has actually gone down significantly. And in addition, and this is the real, the real point to my uh, argument, is that you would have incurred a capital loss of around about $3,000. You would have lost nearly half your money. So that in effect, your total return is negative. It's negative $2,000. So this focus on dividend alone can be a very dangerous thing to do. And, and Telstra is not an isolated example. There are many, many examples that you could go through where we're seeing a similar sort of thing. And some of them are far worse, companies like AMP, for instance. Now, let's look at CSL. So if we bought CSL in July of 2015, and we bought 72 shares at $86, which was the price then, so I've kept the dollar amounts the same, so that's a, roughly a $6,000 investment. Then at the time, CSL was yielding just a little under 2%, so less than half. The percentage dividend that uh, Telstra was paying. And the dividends received since have been a little bit less than Telstra, only $810. But the dividends have been increasing every single year without missing a beat, whereas Telstra's dividends have been going backwards. The current yield, if you're looking at buying CSL today, 
is even worse than it was in 2015. It's only 1%. But your yield on the original purchase price would now be 3.3, which is getting much more reasonable. But this is the really important point. The capital gain was nearly $14,000. So you're looking at a total return of $14,778 as opposed to a total return loss on Telstra of nearly $2,000. So to me, the case is pretty clear. And if you're placing uh, your emphasis heavily or exclusively on what companies are paying the best dividend, then you could actually be setting yourself up for a very, very poor outcome. So I hope that practical example really rams the point home about the need to start to think a bit differently about how you go about investing. Further to that, I think this grossly misleading focus on dividends um, has some other ramifications as well. So apart from the issue of, of starving companies of, of growth capital, so if a company's paying out 80 or 90% of its profit as dividend, then there's obviously very little capital being retained to grow the company. So that holds their progress back as well. Far too much emphasis, in my view, is, is placed on dividends to the exclusion of, of far more uh, vital metrics around growth. So I would really encourage investors to think about total return and not just think about dividend return. It, it's just part of the Australian psychology, but I think it really does have to change. It's not the same elsewhere around the world. So unless you've already got a lot of wealth, in which case a, um, a very small uh, percentage return on your capital is, uh, is okay, you can live with that, then I think for most investors, you really need to be taking a different approach to your investing. All right, let's look at the US market. Uh, the S&P ended up rising 0.7% on the week and amazingly is now just 20 points below the record high. And we're probably going to see a bit of a pause around this area. Um, it, would, it would be most unusual if the market went straight through the uh, all-time highs. So you can expect some consolidation. But <laughs> the point is, in less than four months, we've rebounded amazingly from those March lows. What really encourages me is that the breadth is still improving. What I mean by the breadth is the number of stocks that are advancing. This, this despite some popular commentary, this is not a rally being led just by the FANG stocks or other tech majors. This is a very broad based rally that, uh, that is including uh, a lot of the American market. So that certainly validates the strength that we're seeing in the index. Furthermore, we're seeing the transport group and particularly truckers uh, leading very, very strongly, which is a terrific sign. I mean, that's always been the case. That's, that's going back a um, 100 years. If transports are doing well, then generally the economy is doing well. And that's certainly the case at the moment. And the, the price of uh, the trucking stocks is going up very robustly. But that is not because of speculation. That is because their results are just good enough to support it. There is also a record number of stocks which are raising guidance. Now, I can tell you in America, the way the game is played there is that companies tend to under promise so that they can over deliver. So in this environment, there is no requirement for American CEOs to be going out on a limb and raising guidance, yet they are. So that tells you that they must be feeling pretty confident about the outlook. Otherwise, why would they be doing it? Now, right now, we're seeing some temporary rotation into defensive stocks. Um, some money is coming out of technology in some of the more aggressive areas, communications. But th look, this is only temporary. These little rotations go on all the time. It's actually healthy because it prevents those leading sectors from getting uh, just too hot and then a, a bigger correction ensues. So what's going on at the, at the moment is perfectly normal. It's very healthy and it's setting up some really outstanding trades in the more aggressive sectors of, uh, of technology and communications and healthcare. Now the US dollar uh, remains under some downward pressure, it was down slightly on the week, 93.1. Um, 
and the 10-year yield unexpectedly jumped up to 0.71. And that certainly played a bit of a part in triggering the correction we had in, uh, in the precious metals. So let's jump in and take a look at some of the charts. So we'll start first of all with the S&P. There's the all-time highs, 3391. And you can see on uh, both Wednesday and Thursday that we got to within an absolute whisker, hit a high of 3387. So basically, we're now back at a double top. Now, if you look at the range of the candles at this point in time, they're still quite small. So we're not seeing any sort of sharp and wild fluctuations. Yes, the market is overbought at the index level and it's extended and so are many stocks. But I think all we're probably going to see, and that's all we have in the market is probability, not absolutes. All we're probably going to see is some sort of uh, relatively mild consolidation. And if you just go on what we can see, rather than you know what we would like to postulate, then the index has been pretty much hugging the 20 day moving average, which at the moment is, uh, is only around about 80 or 90 points below the current market. So I would expect that any consolidation on what we can see at the moment is probably not going to be of any significant direction or dimension. All right, let's just quickly look at the NASDAQ. There's the NASDAQ. It's just way above the February highs. As you can see, February highs were here at around 9,700. We're now trading up in the 11,000. So the NASDAQ has continued to be enormously strong. And look at the relative performance down the bottom here to the S&P. The NASDAQ continues to outperform the, uh, the S&P quite comfortably. Now, I mentioned the transport sector. This is the transportation index. Uh, again, not quite back to its all-time highs. This is on a weekly chart, but uh, it's certainly getting there. And it's looking extremely robust at the moment. And as I said earlier, the results are certainly backing the price trend. And you can see down the bottom here, the underperformance of the transport group, which goes uh, all the way back into 2018, uh, has now turned around dramatically. And the transport group is outperforming the, uh, the S&P quite comfortably. And of course, the dynamics of how the US market works means that fund managers are going to be compelled to put more money to work in the transport group. The Australian market, our Aussie dollar, uh, slightly higher to 71.59, and we'll come back and look at those, uh, those currencies in a minute. Um, it was a pretty stable week for currencies, not a lot of movement. Now, the ASX 200, um, we gained 1.9% on the week, um, but we certainly are seeing uh, dividend cuts as being probably the highlight amongst the, the old economy, old world kind of stocks. On the other side of things, as I showed with the comparison between Telstra and CSL, the, benefit, the beneficiaries, I beg your pardon, of COVID-19 are doing extremely well. So the difference between the two different parts of the market is about as stark as you ever want to see. All right, let's just have a look at the US dollar. So we've broken support here on the US dollar. We've got major support coming up just under 90, and you'd be a brave person to say that we're probably not going to go there, and that's going to be a positive for gold and, uh, and precious metals. The Australian dollar, fairly similar, didn't really move very much last week. Okay, let's move on to precious metals. Now, gold had a sharp correction. It all occurred pretty much in one day where the gold price um, fell by some, nearly $150 uh, in the futures market within a 24-hour period. But net for the week, it was down $89. Uh, it finished at $19.45. Now, I've been talking about this for quite a few weeks and saying that we weren't at a time to be buying gold and gold stocks and that you needed to exercise some caution because this was the correction that we had to have. And so, again, it's it's uncomfortable when it happens, but it's necessary. The market has to have these pullbacks so that it just doesn't get too overheated. And the practicality of it is that 
most of the money was would have been in the market, particularly the money from the speculators. And that would have left very little uh, incremental money for more buying. And because the speculators are so heavily leveraged that once the market starts moving to the downside, they are really forced by margin calls to get out of the way. And so those, um, those pullbacks are always going to be sharp for that reason. Now, if we look at precious metal stocks, so I've been very anxiously waiting, uh, and it won't be the case, so much the case in Australia because the shutdowns of the Australian uh, gold mining industry were minimal, if any at all. But overseas, um, mine shutdowns because of the COVID lockdown were actually quite common. So that on a global basis, the earnings were quite impacted. Even though the gold price went up a lot in the quarter, uh, a lot of companies that are in GDX, the, the main ETF for global companies, uh, their earnings actually went down because they had to wind back their production. And some of the companies saw production cuts of anything up to 20 or 25%. So we're yet to see the big impact on earnings, but it's coming because now that production is, is back in swing, pretty much uh, miners all around the world are, are back now to full production. Um, we're going to see the impact of that rising gold price. So the best is yet to come for precious metals, and that's why GDX has been lagging um, the price of gold. It's not been amplifying it in the same manner that it normally would, but the real payoff is coming now that we're back to full output. So let's take a look at the gold chart. So this is gold on a weekly basis, breakout. Uh, massive breakout to new all-time highs above the 2011 high. We didn't pause at all. We just went straight through, had uh, two more very strong weeks. And then, as you can see, a, uh, a very, very powerful downdraft. Now, intraday, it actually went and broke this support, which I think surprised a lot of people. Um, but I guess that's just how many how many stop losses were being triggered in the market at the time and it just overshot massively to the downside. But that period only really lasted around about three to four hours if you were watching the, the futures market as, as I was very closely at the time. Um, so we managed to get back above that, that key support level and as you can see, uh, we went up quite, quite nicely on Thursday and then pretty much marked time on Friday. Now I can't tell you where, whether this correction is finished in, uh, in precious metals. We may come back further, back test this 50 day moving average, test the last area of uh, support, which would bring us back into the, um, the low to mid 1800s. So a, a drop of another $100 in the gold price is entirely possible, but that would not do anything at all to change the primary trend. So I think be prepared for volatility, use volatility to your advantage, have some capital allocated to, to buy into precious metals when the market tells us it's the right time to do it. Now silver was even more volatile. Silver I think fell 15% on, um, uh, on Tuesday or Monday whenever the, uh, the big fall was. But similarly silver has also um, recovered very, very strongly as well. So that's the precious metals market. Now, I just want to cover again, because I've, I've had some questions about what actually drives the, the gold and silver prices. So these are the key drivers. And, and some people are still of the opinion that gold just responds to the currency um, and that there's very little else contributes to the gold price. And that is just so not the case. Probably the, the most important determinant of what happens with the gold price is negative real interest rates. So that's nominal interest rates, less inflation. And we've, we've got um, negative real interest rates uh, all around the world. And when you're in that environment, it means there is no penalty for owning gold because gold doesn't pay a yield. And if you can't get a yield in real terms in the bond market, then there's, you might as well go and own gold. So that's one of the really key drivers. And it's very, very hard to see that situation changing for a long period of time, ne real negative interest rates. The second one is fear of inflation. 
And whilst people have been saying that all this stimulus was going to lead to inflation since probably 2011, and it hasn't happened, largely because technology has helped to keep the lid on inflation and also the impact of, uh, of China's exports has really exported deflation to, um, to the rest of the world. But we have got this incredibly ballooning US budget and trade deficits. And at some point in time, you would think that that has to have some sort of impact on inflation. The Fed's balance sheet is now $1.7 trillion, which is just an extraordinary number. The third thing is the fear of loss of purchasing power. Because, you know, obviously with purchasing power going down, currencies being debased, then that, um, that adds very much to the allure of gold. And it's pretty clear that the central bank playbook to deal with this mountain of debt that, that they've created and are still creating, still increasing, is, um, is going to be to debase the currencies and, uh, and, and deal with the debt mountain in that fashion. The next one is the alternative in bond yields. So um, when I prepared this, the bond yield was at 0.55. It's now at 0.7, but it's still pretty low. So the alternative is 0.5 to 0.7% per annum for the next 10 years. That doesn't sound like a very attractive investment to me. And, and also with the possibility of a capital loss as well. And the final one that I put in there, it's not unimportant, but it's only one part of the mix, and that's the direction of the US dollar. So for those that think that the, the gold price is only a US dollar currency story, then you, know, you, you need to understand all the things that do go into driving the gold price. Now, looking at other commodities, uh, copper was unchanged at uh, 289 and crude oil uh, was down very slightly to 41.22. Did go a little bit higher during the week. There's the spot copper chart. So we've been pretty much just tracking sideways since uh, late June. So wrapping it up, the question to me is which sectors and how? It's, it's not being stuck in old economy thinking where your returns are, are poor at best, and possibly with declining returns if you're going to get a capital loss on top of that. So the path forward to me is just crystal clear. The answer lies not in whether to, but in how to. It, you know, it's about your game plan. If, if you're nervous about the elevated valuations of some of these stocks, like CSL and, and hundreds of others of these new economy stocks that where the businesses really are doing very well, they're growing their earnings and they're growing their dividends, um, then the answer is to work out a game plan that allows you to, to participate on terms that are acceptable to you. And that can be done. If you don't know how to do it, then find someone that can help you with that process. Now, Portfolio Analyst this week um, is just going to be an ongoing review of tremendous opportunities. The, one of the biggest issues I have at the moment is just managing how many opportunities that are on my, on my plate, both in Australia uh, and in America. It really is a very, very exciting period. And the final point I just make about Portfolio Analyst, and I, I said this to the, to the group, because of late, uh, we've had a, a number of um, questions raised on stocks that I was not aware of. And when I did the research, I could see just what tremendous opportunities these stocks were. And the whole group is benefiting from that. So the power of the group is something that I think is a, is a, um, a terrific um, aspect of Portfolio Analyst. If you haven't taken the trial, then it's, uh, it's available for a two-week trial for a dollar. I'd really encourage you to do it. I think at the very least, you will learn a lot about how the market really works. There's my website address and email address for those that either want more information about what I do or would like to communicate with me directly. That's it for this week. Cheers.